You know, the other day I was digging through some old papers and I ran across uh, this exam question. Uh, <laughs> but actually the low point in my education occurred at the very beginning. It was in kindergarten. I was expelled for misbehavior. My dear mother lived to be 105 and she never quite got over it. <laughs> in those days, uh, I was a kid in Colorado in high school. I had a teacher who told me that if I would apply to Princeton and could get in, they would pay my way through. And as it turned out, uh, I became the first of my family to ever get to go to college. Uh, during the summers of those years, I had a job putting, spreading tar on roofs. I learned two important lessons from it. Uh, the first was that there are some very fine people who make a living spreading tar on roofs. And the second was that the way to get off the roof was to get an education. I married a girl who immigrated to America when she was 19 years old. She came from Stockholm. Uh, she arrived alone with two suitcases, uh, $50, the job she got out of the uh, New York Times want ads. We've been married 51 years now. Uh, we met when I was in engineering school. Today she tells me that the odds were good, but the goods were odd. <laughs> We've had two children and three grandchildren, all of whom are good people. At my 50th reunion, my alma mater actually gave me an honorary doctorate, and the New York Times carried a story about it. The headline of the New York Times read, Muhammad Ali and three others received Princeton degrees. <laughs> now, why do I tell you all of this? Uh, the reason is that we lived the American dream, and the American dream may not survive. What's changed? In a word, what's changed is called globalization. I would assert that there have been two major technological developments that have brought about globalization. The first of these was the advent of the modern jet aircraft that makes it possible to move objects, including people, around the world, literally at the speed of sound, or very close. And secondly, the advent of modern information systems that have made it possible to move ideas and knowledge and data around the world at the speed of light. Francis Cairn Cross, writing in The Economist, characterized this development in the following words, distance is dead. And Tom Friedman has said that uh, technology has accidentally made Beijing, Bangalore, and Bethesda next door neighbors. Lots of examples. Near the White House in Washington, there is a office building that the receptionist in the lobby does not sit at a desk. She's on a flat screen display on the wall. She doesn't even live in Washington. She lives in Pakistan. There are call centers in India where Americans can call for help on their computers and the likes. And in those call centers, uh, they encourage the young students to take courses where they can learn to speak with a Western or an American Midwestern accent to make Americans feel more comfortable. They also encourage them to take a uh, Western pseudonym for the same reason. Uh, my neighbor in Maryland the other day actually talked to a young fellow in Bangalore who swore that his name was Abraham Lincoln. If you get a CAT scan at many hospitals in the United States today, it will be read in real time by a radiologist in Australia or in, in, uh, in India. And there's a gentleman in uh, France who had his gallbladder removed by a surgeon who was 4,000 miles away in New York at the time using a remotely controlled robot. As an engineer, I sure hope that he had a backup surgeon somewhere around. But, uh, <laughs> But perhaps the most important uh, of these kinds of examples is that for the first time, Americans no longer will have to compete for jobs with their neighbors around town. They have to compete with their neighbors around the planet. And it's important to keep in mind in that regard that Americans have not come to enjoy a GDP, gross domestic product per capita, that is six times the average of the rest of the world by our being mediocre. What's all this mean? I would offer the following argument. Uh, the first point would be that the quality of life of the citizens of a developed country 
will depend very heavily in the future on their having quality jobs. And secondly, that for every percent increase in jobs in America, it requires about a 1.7 percent increase in gross domestic product. And then there have been numerous studies, one of which won a Nobel Prize, that show that between 50 and 85 percent of the job growth, of the GDP growth in America, is attributable to advancements in science and in technology. And finally, advances in science and technology are principally attributable to three factors. One is new knowledge, one is educated people, and one is an innovative ecosystem. Now, you might ask, of course, what business does an aerospace engineer like me have doing making uh, economic arguments like that? And I would just remind you, I am a rocket scientist. <laughs> so how are we doing uh, in these three important categories? Let's start at the beginning with new knowledge, the underpinning of which is basic research. The U.S. government now invests as much in research in math, engineering, physics, and chemistry each year as the growth in health costs in this country every 10 weeks. If, if you also look at the U.S. investment in such important areas as biomedical research, that's declined by 22 percent in the recent decade alone. The United States now has dropped to sixth place in its investment in research and development per unit of GDP, and we're 29th in the world in our government's share of research and development within the nation itself. That brings us to the subject of educated talent, and there we'll begin at the beginning in grades K through 12, kindergarten through 12th grade. Today, in international standardized tests, U.S. 15-year-olds finish in 17th place in the science tests and 25th place in math tests, and that's among 34 OECD nations. Another independent international study has just ranked the U.S. class that graduated from high school last year in overall performance is 32nd in the world. We now have dropped from first place to ninth place in high school graduation rate, and from first place to seventh in college graduation rate. But for once, the problem isn't money. We spend more per student than all but one other nation in the world. The problem is not what we spend, it's how we spend it. In the last 40 years, we've increased our spending per student in real terms by 140%. We've increased the staffing per student by 75 percent. But during the same period of time, the test that's called the nation's report card has shown that in terms of science performance, we've stayed about the same, no improvement. Math performance, a slight decline. This is the first young adult generation in our nation's entire history that will be less well-educated than their parents. And many inequities have crept into our educational system. For example, a child that's born this afternoon in America, the best predictor of whether they will go to college or not is whether their parents went to college, a surrogate for wealth. And think about this. The, the poorest quartile in terms of academic performance of wealthy of parents of wealthy children has the same probability of graduating from college as the highest quartile of, poor, of children from poor families. That brings us to the subject of higher education where the story is altogether different. In the United States, the, uh, the ranking that's given by uh, Shanghai Zhengtao, Zhengtong University that prepares rankings of universities around the world, we rank uh, in the top five, five of the top six at 18 of the top 25 universities in the entire world. A tsunami, though, is about to engulf higher education in the developed countries. And one of the groups that will be most impacted are our great state universities that educate 70% of our students. And there are several reasons for this. I think the first is that the business model 
of our great universities, public universities, has suddenly broken. Our state legislatures have, many of them, decided to disinvest in higher education. Many of them, on, or on average, they've reduced their investment by 39 percent, in the worst case, by 79 percent. This has shifted an enormous burden to the parents and the families and the students themselves who are trying to get through college because of increases in tuition to offset the reduction in state commitment to education. And today, the debt from higher education that families bear exceeds the nation's debt for credit cards. The Secretary of Education tells of visiting with a family who was trying to decide which of their two twins they could afford to send to college. This is not the American dream. This is the American nightmare. But let me say a few words specifically about scientists and engineers, since the evidence is that those will be the people who create the most jobs for the nation as a whole. In Asia, 21% of the degrees that are awarded are awarded in engineering. In Europe, the figure is 12%. In the U.S., it's 4.5%. In a recent study of 93 different nations, the United States ranked in 79th place in terms of the fraction of their baccalaureate degrees that were awarded in engineering. The nation that most closely matches us in both science and engineering in that regard is Mozambique. Many of the students of this country seem to have adopted the policy suggested by the Washington Post that not long ago had a full-page article uh, the headline of which read, How to Get Good Grades in College. And the subhead read, Don't Study Engineering. And my own reviews have shown that if the United States wants to have one more native-born engineer with a PhD in the year 2030, we need to start with a pool of 3,000 eighth graders today. Well, another factor that's impacted higher education is the technological revolution in pedagogy that's occurring. Historically, the measure of a great university was a quality library and a quality faculty. But today, the students carry the library around in their pocket. And when it comes to teaching classes, there are interactive computers that not only teach classes very effectively, but now have learned to grade uh, essay questions. With regard to faculty and lectures, a small cadre of world-class teachers located around the world will be able to teach uh, through distance learning. How this will all come out isn't very clear to me. On the one hand, it could make college education more affordable and more inclusive, which would be wonderful. On the other hand, it could make a college education consist of sitting in your apartment looking at a computer screen for four years. Another factor that's certainly impacting our universities is that other nations are improving, which is good. But one impact of that is that we may find it much more difficult to attract the brilliant young people to come here as students, decide to stay here, work here, and create jobs uh, for people in America. And a strong argument could be made that foreign-born individuals uh, have really been the glue that's held together the U.S. science and engineering enterprise these last few decades. Two-thirds of the PhDs granted by U.S. universities go to foreign-born individuals in the field of engineering. A disproportionate majority of the Nobel Prizes that are awarded to Americans go to Americans that were foreign-born. And over half of the CEOs in Silicon Valley that originally founded their companies were foreign-born. That brings me then to the third and final element of competing for jobs, namely the innovation ecosystem. And how do we rank there? Well, a few factors. Uh, U.S. firms spend twice as much money on litigation uh, as they spend on research. Americans spend more money on potato chips than we spend on energy research. Uh, General Motors spends more on health care than they spend on steel. Uh, the U.S. 
code of regulation is now 175,000 pages long. The United States just moved into first place in having the highest corporate tax rate in the world, backed by a 17,000 page tax code. The U.S. tax code encourages corporations in America that earn money abroad to reinvest that money abroad and create jobs elsewhere. And don't bring it back here to create jobs. But our immigration policies discourage people from coming from the other countries to America to fill positions that are badly needed, for example, in science and technology. And when they come here, it tries to drive them back out as quickly as it can. No enemy could have designed a more dangerous system for our nation. That brings me to the subject of liberal arts, which I want to touch on very quickly. Uh, I w it was not in a course in thermodynamics, for example, that I learned about ethical decision making. And I found in my life there were many specific instances where things occurred that I was able to benefit from the study of humanities. Uh, I'll share one quick one. Uh, a group of us were sitting around the office trying to decide whether we should sell a small part of our company that uh, had been a loss leader for a long time. And we were hoping for maybe a better job, better offer later. But as I listened to the debate, I couldn't help but think of, of uh, Shakespeare's Phoebe, who, let's just say, was not particularly well endowed. And she was finally received an offer of marriage. And she goes to her friend for Rosalind for advice, because Phoebe hopes that maybe she should hold out for a better offer later on. And her friend Rosalind turns to her and says, I, I, I must tell you, friendly in your ear, sell when you can, you are not for all markets. <laughs> And you'll be happy to know our company sold. <laughs> I'm often asked, am I a pessimist or an optimist? And the answer to that question is that uh, a pessimist is a person who wants to be an optimist, but has been exposed to the facts. <laughs> My message today is that the American dream can survive, but only if we have the willpower to make the changes to the problems I've described to make America a place that can continue to offer opportunity to all people. Churchill once said, you can always count on the Americans to do the right thing after they have tried everything else. <laughs> this is a case where we need to get it right, right now. Thank you.